Hello, everyone, and a very good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. Uh, thank you for attending this title, Your Path to Enterprise AI. Uh, now, Enterprise AI is a term that's often used to express ambitions for organizations who want to scale out um, AI capabilities. And I'll be using some examples today and anecdotes from my experiences of working with some of you uh, in your peers. So yes, as I said, uh, this is um, entitled Your Path to Enterprise AI uh, and tales from the field that I've encountered. Now, what we're gonna cover today is um, go through what the path to enterprise AI looks like, some of the ambitions that organizations look to achieve uh, from day one uh, towards the end of the journey. Uh, what some of the key challenges are that I've seen um, talking to organizations. And it's not just about the software itself, but there's also an element of people and processes that need to be married all together uh, to achieve what organizations want. And then some of the things that, that I can offer in terms of helping you to overcome these challenges and this idea of this acceleration formula. formula. How do you scale out uh, and build out these capabilities to really rapidly deliver value to your organizations? Uh, and then I'll wrap things up uh, at the end. So I talked about the path to enterprise AI. Now at the beginning at the top, bottom left, sorry, you can see that um, organizations have this idea where they've got lots of data available, built some sort of data lake, um, have a data warehouse in place, but want to achieve this ambition of enterprise AI. Uh, and that is, you know, how do you transform thousands of activities across the organization, be it finance, operations, sales, marketing, and so on? Um, how do you involve many thousands of people in, involved in that data effort? Uh, and really, you know, put into production, um, in some cases, millions of models, uh, as we've seen, and deliver these data projects that are going to deliver value to the business. But it, it's not as easy as that. You know, how do you go from that, you know, day one, day zero, all the way to enterprise AI? Um, and so I'll go through some of the challenges that need to be overcome to help you actually achieve that uh, as we go through the journey. So the first one is this concept of velocity paralysis. And if you look in today's day and age, there are a variety of technologies that organizations um, have to deal with. Um, SQL, of course, has been there forever and a day. But if you look at the rise of Hadoop and then how that starts to fall out of favor and then more uh, interest around Spark and Kubernetes. Kubernetes, certainly we're seeing a lot of that uh, within our customers and asking for capabilities in that space. So there's a whole bunch of, you know, data related technologies that have to be taken into consideration. And that becomes a key question. You know, which technology should you use? Which should be the platforms of choice that you look at? Um, how do you get started? You know, do you look at some sort of data lake you build? Do you look at clustering? What about containerization? You know, what does that look like in the current landscape? And as well as that, what sort of skills do you recruit for? Do you recruit for those skills that you need today? Uh, what about future-proofing those skills? You know, how do you make sure that those skills can then adapt uh, and work with the new technologies that are gonna come forward? But also, you know, what about the skills that are gonna leave the organization? If you're working with the latest and greatest technologies, and you're building up those skills and capabilities, then people may find they're more valuable in the marketplace outside of your organization. So how do you either hold on to those or mitigate some of the risks uh, around that? So that's the first point, you know, the idea of uh, the velocity of paralysis that's caused by that. Um, the second challenge I've seen is around this concept, uh, and they call it the Babel spaghetti. So if you look at the right, the, the Tower of Babel is sitting there. So this is about, you know, the variety of languages and the way people work across an organization. If you look at a traditional IT project, typical workflow is business owners will design what capabilities they want. Um, IT will develop uh, these capabilities, and then they'll have to be deployed out into the big wide world, put into operation to deliver value. But then, as we all know, there's iterative process where the design needs to be tweaked and amended uh, and then put back into development and deployment to deliver value to the business. And that cycle continues over time. But if you look at a traditional data project, um, it's quite different in the sense that um, there will be that definition phase, but somebody has to then prepare the data and make that data available. And then that's fed into a, a team of data scientists, and modelers who actually build that modeling then IT have got to take that work and deploy that and put that into production to deliver value as it goes into operation to the business. And that too is an iterative cycle as well. But then if you think about how these people are operating, they are different personas working across different parts of an organization typically. 
Um, and, and they'll want to have input on other people. So somebody who's doing the modeling may go back and say to um, the business analyst or somebody involved in the data to say, actually, um, I've got problems with the data itself. There's missing fields, there's problems with the quality of data, or I don't have the right volume of data that I need. So they've got to feed that input um, into the, that specific team and then get the output from that as well. But then they may find actually, you know what, I can do some shadow work myself and I can see what data needs to be amended. So I'll just affect that data myself. Now that causes issues around governance as well. So who's actually authorized and approved to make changes to that data? Who was the last person who made changes to that data? And what were those changes as well? So you've got to keep track uh, of what those changes are. But then, you know, the business analyst may then start to look at some sort of auto modeling capabilities. The business owner wants to validate the output and say, well, actually, am I getting the output that I want? Am I getting the levels of accuracy when I run these models that I want to be able to see? And then the IT people may see some refactoring capabilities that need to be brought into play. And all of this then starts to exacerbate and become a real problem. And as you can see, you know, this is why we call it the Babel spaghetti. Everybody has to work together, has to share input to each other. But also the problem is when somebody leaves, how do you capture that intelligence or knowledge? How do you deal with that going forward as well? And that becomes a real problem. So as you can see, sometimes what happens is the lines between the data people, the coders, people building the models and IT who are putting things into production can get blurred as well. So people start to take on more and more activities that are not purely their disciplines that they should be working with. But more importantly, how do you align these teams and how do you make them converge and work together? Because they've got different skills and capabilities. They're all using different tools to achieve what they want. So bringing that together is a real challenge. Um, and we hear about silos of, you know, people working in different teams, the fragmented approach to actually performing analytics, uh, which is a challenge as you start to scale up and scale out the things that you want to do. The third one is operationalization. You know, and I call it a fairy tale because it's something that some people are unaware of, but is a key consideration. So let me start by telling you a story. So once upon a time, there was a handsome prince. And sadly, that handsome prince was captured by a big, ugly green dragon. And then along came a princess who slayed the dragon. And it meant that the prince and the princess lived happily ever after. Or did they? Well, if you think about it, just because the princess has slayed the dragon, freed the prince, and they were supposed to live happily ever after, there are some key considerations they need to take into account. First one being, they may have to look at what sort of carriage do they get? Do they get a two door? Do they get a five door? Do they get a hatchback? Where do they live? How big a place do they need to actually live? How many bedrooms? How many turrets and so on? What about children? How many children are they going to have? Um, this is like our home, we have to make sure we have an even number of children, to just make sure that there is not one out and the children all play together. So I think it becomes a, a key consideration uh, for the parents there. So the point being that just because you've defeated the dragon doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to live happily ever after. There are other considerations that you've got to take into account to achieve that happiness and the goal that you want to achieve. Now, at this point, you're going, well, Raj, what are you talking about? So let me draw some parallels. Once upon a time, there was a very clever model that had been created. And that model was built using the latest technologies, uh, fed with the latest uh, data sets, uh, had all the latest storage and compute capabilities, and was designed by a very bright data scientist. Now, just because the data scientists have built this very clever model, doesn't necessarily mean that they deliver great business um, value forever after going forward because building that model doesn't just deliver that business value. Because if you look at the life cycle of a data project, you've got to come up with the idea, the ideation phase to come up with the scenario. You've got to design that model itself. But once that model has been designed, it must be put into production and then deployed within the organization. It must run and be executed, and then it delivers business value. So if you look at that operationalization phase, as we call it, you know, automating it and putting it into um, production so it delivers business value, that comes after the ideation and the design phase. And we call that O16N for short. So that whole operationalization piece is absolutely key to actually just uh, to go beyond the design phase of that model itself. 
So the fourth challenge then um, is this curse of decreasing productivity. Now, this is something that you'll all be familiar with as you start to work on very exciting things at the very, very beginning, but certainly come at the end of a period of time. You say, well, where did that enthusiasm go or where did what we actually set out to achieve? Uh, why weren't we able to achieve that in the timeline that we wanted? And so it's very much the same with these data projects. So if you look at right at the beginning, um, the idea is you want to work on high impact projects, you know, things that really are going to matter and deliver value to the business and minimize the amount of time you spend on low impact projects. But then if you look at the uh, X axis, you know, time scale is that then actually, if you look over time, what are we actually working on? Well, as soon as you start to put things into production, there's this maintenance phase that kicks in. So there's some debugging that's required. There were some problems with the coding itself. So that comes back to the team itself to say, well, actually, can you maintain these past projects? Okay, well, that eats away at some of that high impact project time that had been set aside. And there are some urgent demands from individual managers and teams who get excited and like what they see and say, well, actually, can you come along and you know add these bits into the project or can I feed in a new data set to the model that you've built? And so that starts to burden the team that have been working on this. And then there's some more changes that need to be done. And, and the reality is at the end of the year, you look at this and say, well, where did all of those good things go? When we set out to actually work on the things that really mattered and delivered value to the business, how much of our time is actually spent doing that? Because we're now working on low impact projects and we're doing a lot of maintenance work that really the excitement that was generated at the beginning of the year is gone. So as it says, you know, teams easily lose focus and interest as well. You know, what they actually set out to achieve, what they want to be doing on a day-to-day -day basis, they can no longer do. So in summary, you know, some of the things that are, are challenges that I've seen is the concept of velocity paralysis. How do you get started? Where do you invest your time, effort, money, and resource? Uh, the Babel spaghetti, the, the personas, the different personas in the organization that work with separate tools and technologies and have their own languages that they use and the processes that they work with as well. How do you bring them all together so that it's all coordinated? And at this point of this operationalization fairy tale, just coming up with the idea of the model isn't good enough. It's got to be put into operation within the organization to deliver value. And the fourth one being this idea of decreasing productivity. Uh, it's all very well working on high value projects at the beginning, but once you put those into production, you'll tend to find that a lot of time is spent working on the low impact and also maintaining the work that you've been doing. Now, the fundamental challenge isn't, isn't just software you know, itself, because so, we all know there's siloed data and there's ways of dealing with that. But actually, as I mentioned earlier, people are siloed. They work across the organization in different departments. They're fragmented. They're geographically dispersed as well. And also, they have their own processes that they work to. And these very much are in silo uh, and not visible to people across the organization. So we know we can bring the data together, build some sort of big data lake or a data warehouse. But actually, how do you overcome this idea of the people working in silos and also the processes being siloed as well? How do you bring all of that together? Uh, and that's something that I'll show you uh, as we go on. So if we start with the first challenge and how we address that at Daytriku, well, the idea is you want to get results today, but whatever you build has got to be built for tomorrow as well. How do you build some future proofing into it? So you've got existing skills that need to be leveraged. You've got current infrastructure that must serve, serve the needs of the business today, but also be ready for tomorrow as well. But you want to be using the most up-to-date technologies because that operates more efficiently, it's faster, and also connects with your organization's capabilities. But also, how do you extend all of those based upon today's requirements and for the future as well? And that's where Data IQ sits on top of all of this capability. If you think about it as a federated orchestration platform that allows you to build this layer of abstraction and the intelligence for your data products, you can then push the uh, instructions down to the compute and storage layer to orchestrate and achieve what you want to achieve. So that way you're able to tie the technologies and capabilities that you have today, but also anything that then you bring in for the future can be tied into what you've built uh, as a flow or a workflow that's end to end as your data product. So the next one is around that concept of Babel spaghetti, you know, people operating in silos, different personas, using different tools and processes to operate. And so DataIQ is a single platform where everybody can collaborate and work together. So it allows the clickers and the coders 
as we call them, to all operate in one single platform to show you what's happening in a visual manner so you can see where the data came from, how the data was integrated, what uh, processes have been used, who cleans the data and when, and what's the latest set of data that we should be using? What's the model that we can feed this into? And also how do we then put this into production, but also monitor it over time as well. So all of that is in one single platform, which improves efficiency. And in the current climate where people need to be able to do more with less, allows them to scale out uh, the capabilities that they need to deliver back to the business. The third one, this operation, operationalization fairy tale, uh, is really important because as we said it's not just good enough to actually design a model but you've got to put that into production and operationalize it across your business so you've got to look at you know what does that look like when you have to automate it from end to end how do you build a framework to be able to do that so you can package and reuse these capabilities what do operating targets look like there are key metrics that you need to achieve to actually say well that's what we want these models and these data products to deliver for us um, how do you make sure it's achieving what you want? And then how do you automate the monitoring of that? So over time, if there is some model drift or you're not getting results that you want, how do you highlight those exceptions and then deal with those to actually then either bring in new data sets or enrich the data, rebuild the model, and then put that back into production as well. And then continuously allowing it to be retrained, redeployed, and providing any rollbacks uh, situations that are needed as well. So a whole framework uh, is needed for that. And then the fourth one, the curse of the decreasing productivity, you know, it's all very well building these things, but actually, as we said earlier, you know, how do you make sure people don't lose focus and lose interest? Well, reusability is key. You know, how do you reuse components you've already built that actually make the building of new components very easy, but also how do you automate these things as well? An absolute priority as you start to then scale out the work that your limited resources or your finite team that can do for you today. And then you can start to divide and conquer and, and really accelerate the delivery of enterprise AI. Because once you start to operationalize all of this and it starts to become automated and you can reuse these things, you've got this idea of safe self-service analytics. You know, how do the people within the organization get the answers that they need to unformulated or unknown questions by handling this themselves? So if you put the data products into their hands, how can they feed in new data sets? How can they then get the answers that they want uh, within their organizations? And this is something I saw with a, a government organization recently who realized that once they build the model, it's just different data sets that they want to feed from different parts of the organization to get the outputs that they want. They don't want the data scientists uh, burdened with that. They want them to create that model but put that in the hands of the end users across different parts of the business or organization in this case, to actually be able to operate that themselves and get the outputs that they want. So as you've seen, you know, what DataIQ does is absolutely take organizations on that journey from day zero of aspirations of achieving enterprise AI, but not only achieving uh, in the early days, building these models, putting them to production, but really accelerating so you can actually deliver use cases across uh, the organization. So be it predictive maintenance within production plants or vehicles, uh, be it some sort of churn prediction. Uh, a use case I saw recently was the organization whose logistics provider wanted to look at employee churn because they're very busy at the moment and they want to make sure they hold on to the right staff. It's very expensive for them to recruit new staff, onboard staff, um, and get them ramped up as well as so they can deliver a good service. So how can they spot some of those trends uh, to start with, uh, if you look at the airlines now, you know, dynamic pricing is absolutely key. You know, how do they look at dynamic and ancillary pricing of products? So if they sell a seat, can they then um, upsell uh, and cross-sell um, the seat itself? Um, I.e. a pre-booked seat, can they sell extra reg room, additional baggage, uh, and so on. As you can see on the right, um, the platform is applicable across all industries. So be it manufacturing, consumer goods, financial services, retail, uh, it's relevant uh, across all sectors there as well. So wrapping up, you know, fairy tales can come true, but you shouldn't take them for granted. So some of these challenges, uh, and there are many more as well, that you need to take into consideration and make sure that actually as you start to go on this journey, you know what those challenges are going to be and how you're going to address those. Okay, well, thank you for listening in, and we look forward to discussing some of your challenges around getting value from enterprise AI. So hopefully, We'll get to speak with you soon. Thank you again.